animals. But if yeah. I see them, I see them, if I don't see them, I say, no, I don't really have a list of animals. There's the animals that we have here and, and the behaviors, like you said, and you watch something. And it, I think that is uh, um, the most fascinating part. So yeah. um, whatever will come, will come and animals don't come. And I ne never get to see anything new again. I get to see everything new in the behavior of my animals. So. Absolutely. I, I, it's never ending. There's always something new to see. Absolutely. I love it. Do you do work with, uh, and maybe this is a question that'll steal your thunder, do you do work with creatures other than sharks or is most of your conservation work with sharks? Uh, primarily my conservation work is with shark as a creature, but then my conservation work expands to the caves and obviously uh, the entire ecosystem related with the caves, the mangroves, and we are working now on doing a connection between the sharks and mangroves and the caves. So my primary con concerns are the caves as a freshwater suppliers, the caves as a, um, a unique environment, the land over the caves that then inflects the mangroves that then affects all the rest of the other of the other animals. And then my other work is in plastic pollution, but specifically as a creatures, I'm, I focus on sharks. Okay, perfect. Well, it is 102. We're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Uh, if you're looking at my picture, you'll see that I'm wearing a mask today. I'm in Madison, as you can tell by my view behind me. This looks like Madison, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm in Madison where we have a mask order. Uh, so I want to welcome everybody today to our talk with Christina Zanato. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to stay on mute during the conversation. It just helps keep the, the background noise down. If you have questions, you can ask them at any time in the chat room. Uh, both Christina and I will be monitoring that and we will ask those questions at the end. So please feel free to ask questions at any time and then you can ask them again at the end. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, DiVentures Expert Talk with Christina Zanato and she's gonna talk to us about sharks today. Um, Christina has been a diver, a pro diver since 1994. She's an ocean cave explorer, shark expert, as well as conservation, a speaker, a writer, and doing lots of things around sharks. And as you might have caught, uh, lots of other things as well with conservation. Um, I'm going to introduce you with a quote by Christina on your webpage. It says, water flows through every aspect of our lives, flowing Following that flow makes us realize that everything is so vitally interconnected. And uh, just reading that alone made me super excited to introduce you today to Christina Zanato. So thank you, Christina. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you, Dive Ventures, for having me. Um, welcome to everyone. Um, the subject that I was uh, trying to put together today is uh, fairly big, so forgive me if I don't cover all aspects, but I thought to talk a little bit about what is a shark diving? Um, and I summarize it into a word like shark tourism, and then uh, give an overview of some of the options, but also how we approach these options, and then how I personally, uh, when I go around, uh, look at different operators and different opportunities for shark diving. Just a, a quick background I've been living, and I'm still am, on the island of Grand Bahama, 26 years and counting. It was supposed to be just one year. And I primarily work in a while with Caribbean reef sharks off the coast of Grand Bahama, but I've traveled the world um, and the Bahamas to be with quite a lot of species of sharks, over about 20 species of sharks. And primarily I have actually um, went to places to look at how other people work with sharks, how the shark dives are organized, and how do they do it with the different creatures, but maybe the same species also in a different location. So I have like dedicated all these years also to acquire that. By trade, I am a shark feeder and I'm a shark handler. So if you're against this, maybe I'm not the talk for you because this is not the talk I'm gonna to address today. Today, we're just gonna talk about shark diving in general, if that makes sense, okay? Uh, what I'm gonna do is to start sharing my screen with my little, presentation and then I'm gonna go into the slideshow 
and we go from there. So what is a shark tourism? Primarily with shark tourism, we're talking about the intent to go in the water with sharks, however many species there are available, and have either a uh, active or passive interaction and then these sharks to be into the zone either because they have a natural gathering or we human create a gathering through provisioning. So there's shark diving is basically going in the water with sharks. And it has a different, different levels. So there's a lot of interest for sharks usually in the bigger ones. Usually they win, you know, there's uh, the great whites and the tigers and the bull sharks and, and, and all of that. Those are the ones that attract the most. But understand that there's a, such a variety of sharks and a very unique sharks that can be observed. Maybe there's not as much tourism related with that. The basic shark diving that you can do is a snorkeling. There are some species of sharks. In this case, these are the Exuma Keys in the Bahamas where you can uh, go in the water, it doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the preparedness or anything like that, and snorkel with them. This is snorkeling with the nurse sharks. Uh, there are other sharks that you can snorkel with, uh, one of which is the whale sharks. Uh, there's very two well-known places. One is in Mexico and the other one is in the Philippines. There are two of the most um, famous places to go uh, snorkeling with whale sharks. Um, already these two have two differences, right? The nurse sharks are attracted by the humans that basically clean a little bit of the fish or throw it off the dock and the nurse sharks come in just to munch on the little pieces where uh, with the whale sharks, people try to find the gathering of the whale sharks caused by the plankton. So the whale sharks follow the plankton drifting and the whale sharks uh, find that plankton. And I'll explain a little bit later all about, you know, how to discern, how to find out what to do with all of that. Uh, there's then the shark dives that you can do by finding where the sharks uh, collectively gather. And there's a famous, uh, the Cocos Island, for example, the Galapagos or uh, Palau are some of the places where you find massive gatherings of sharks. So what does it mean? You need to find out where they gather and how they gather, and then you need to travel to that location to dive with that specific. So they could be gathering for um, behavior that, for example, the Cocos Island is still not completely explained why the hammerheads circle around these uh, deep water um, mountains or gatherings are caused by what we call bait balls. So like the sardine run, for example, in South Africa is one of the most famous one. Uh, you can also find the sand tigers out of the Carolina coast that hang around the wrecks but are more prevalent also when you have a collection of, of food. So as you can see, regardless if it's a man provisioned or a nature provision, usually to find the most amount of sharks, you need to find where actually where they go and feed. That is one of the natural ways of actually finding sharks. So understand how they feed, where they feed, and then we go and find the gatherings. You then have what are, and this is what I specifically do, is uh, the natural, the unnatural, but like the um, artificial interaction through basically uh, shark feeding. So you bring down provision in an area where these sharks are known to gather. So there's already been resident sharks, and then you bring in a little bit of food and interact with the animals. And just at this level of hand feeding, there's quite a lot of different um, ways of doing and procedures and, and all of that, which I'm gonna explain. And so the people uh, observe a human interacting with the animals by um, basically feeding and handling them. And this also is uh, something that happens in the Bahamas. It doesn't just happen with Caribbean reef sharks. Um, we go all the way up to basically tiger sharks, our famous tiger beach. So this is a human intervention. They find where the sharks originally gathered. They bring a little bit of food to uh, let the sharks perch the humans. And then people are have the pleasure to sit in the water and watch these animals. Um, there's then dive sites in which you might find yourself that is not species specific. This is a picture out of Tiger Beach as well. And on any given dive, you can have four to about seven different species of sharks. And any dive is going to be the tigers, the Caribbean reef sharks, the nurse sharks, the lemons, the bull sharks, and sometimes even some great hammerheads come through. And 
just a little bit of fish. So you have all these different kind of shark dives. You go from the snorkeling with nurse sharks all the way to be on the water with um, tigers, bulls, creepy sharks all at once. Now I specifically left out of this presentation the uh, cage of the great whites because cage diving is, is, is just a, a standalone. We want to talk about more like specifically scuba and free swimming and, and going with the sharks. Um, so how do we go about this? This is what the three things that I do believe we really, really need to do as divers. We need to do our research, right? We need to call ahead and we need, if needed, to ask questions. Um, so what is a research? Well, first of all is what type of shark do I want to dive with? Or if I'm going in a specific destination, what kind of sharks are in that destination? Um, furthermore, if I want to dive with this type of sharks, for example, is um, what is their season, right? Because I need to figure it out when I'm going to find, you know, the sharks or not. It is very common here for me to find um, people that call me and they said, oh, I'm coming in August. I want to go and dive with the tigers. And it's kind of like, good for you, but we don't have tigers in the summertime. It's like if you try to come to the Dolomites in the summertime and want to go skiing. There's no snow you can go climbing, but you can go skiing. So that is the core of the research. Um, other suggestions, and I wrote here, these are the things. So, so the type of sharks. What sharks am I diving with? What is the season of this shark? Um, things about the shark itself, which goes also in the location. How deep are these sharks? Am I at 10 feet? Am I at 30 feet? Are these 100 foot? Some sharks you have to go to 100, 120 feet to, to actually be able to see them. Which brings back the other research is do I have the right certification? Right? Do I have the right certification for the gas that is going to be used? So this is the research that you need to do. You can't just show up and say, oh, I'm going to go do this dive. It's like, well, this is a 110 foot dive. You need your deep diver certification with nitrox. And you're an open water diver. All right. Location. Um, where is it in the world? Northern hemispheres, the southern hemispheres, do they have reverse seasons? What are the temperatures? The temperatures above the water, the temperatures below the water. What do I need to bring? Do I need to bring a parka? Do I need to bring a sunblock? Okay. Do I need a seven mil suit? Do I need a dry suit? Or can I go with a, a three millimeter um, wet suit? Okay, so this is all part of your research, even just before you even start planning your, your, your trip, is these are the things that you need to know. Distance from shore. One of the things that is very, very important for me, distance from shore. Am I going to the uh, Cocos Island, which is a two and a half day boat ride there and two and a half day boat ride back? Or I'm going like here in Freeport, which is a 15 minutes boat ride from the dock to the shark site. And why is that important? Well, it is important because at the end of the day, besides the risk of inherit with scuba diving, right? If you get bent, right? But you're also going now in the water with animals. So there is an unpredictable part of these animals. So understand what's going to happen. How long is it going to take for that boat to come back? So then those are the questions you also can ask. What is the emergency equipment on board? It is your right to ask that. No operator should actually be upset when you ask if they have oxygen on board, if they have a metaphysical kit on board, if they have a trauma kit, depending on the species of sharks that they have on board. I'll give you an example. Tiger Beach is a beautiful area, 20 feet deep, is two and a half hours from shore. You're thinking, well, it's easy, it's 20 feet deep. It's like, yes, but for me, one of the requirements, for example, I want to be on a vessel that actually have a lifeboat on it. Because if the boat sinks, if not, you know, like boats tend to fail, and they might never sink, but it might also sink. I want to be able to step from that boat into the other one, not float in the ocean with 20 tiger sharks below my legs, right? So these are all the things that you need to start thinking. And then the food source. We're going back to, is it a plankton feeder? Is it a natural feeding? Is it a human feeding? And I'll go a little bit more in detail into the human feeding and what I follow. Right, so also to understand how the animals will behave according to the food source. And there's a huge differences between free feeding animals and animal actually fed by humans. So there's quite a lot of consideration. So this is your research, right? Then you find the location, then you call, and then you ask the questions, okay? You now have your trip. 
what do we do with the sharks? Number one, refresh your skills. We say that, we preach that, we are dive shop owners, dive operators, dive instructors, we always say that, and unmistakably, I am destination. I am not the orange, not the shops. I'm the destination. I receive the people say, oh yeah, my last time was 10 years ago. Right? And refresh your skills. You're not only about to go scuba diving, but you're now going to about to go scuba diving with animals right so you have to have your buoyancy your trim all your things down to a t right especially now after we're coming out out of covid i'm pretty sure quite a lot of you have been staying out of the water loss so refresh your skills two be prepared let me close that it is your responsibility it is not the operator responsibility to remind you all of this so, so den insurance travel insurance I'm going to reopen this so I can see if there's any comment. Right now, COVID issues, what is the country allowing me to do to come in? What is allowing my country to do when I come back? Do your research, but be prepared. Make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. Do I have my dan insurance? Do I have my evacuation plan? Because it's not a matter of if with incidents, it's a matter of when. All right, so you need to understand that we, none of us is invincible and we definitely want to be prepared. I'll give you an example, a pressurized airplane that allows a bent person to be airlifted from Freeport to West Palm, 39 minutes flight, is a $15,000. Dan insurance is what I think $100 for a professional per year, just to give you an idea. So be prepared, make sure, and quote unquote, a passport, make sure your passport is ready as well and you have all the visas and all of that. Don't forget the gear. You have to have your gear service. If it's been a while since you have your, had your gear service, please have a service, all right? Make sure it's in good functioning from the regulators to the BCD to your mask or anything like that, which brings me into the next step. This is my golden rule to this level. It's my golden rule, no new, new, new. So if you're already going in a new environment with new sharks that you've never been diving with, you already have two news, you can't get away from that. Try not to go there with your new seven mil suit that you never dived with, that you don't know what weights you need to wear, that you don't know how your buoyancy is gonna be affected. Try not to go there with your new BCD that has never touched the water because you don't know how it adjusts and how much water displacement, how much extra weight it needs. Try not to go there with your brand new camera that you don't know where to start. And then so you, while somebody says, hey, make sure you have eye contact with the tigers, you're actually there trying to figure out what the buttons do. So the more things you're thinking about bringing on this trip, it's like, ah, oh, I'm going on this trip and I've never been with tiger sharks in the Bahamas. Start thinking about all the other elements that you're bringing in, all right? Because this is task loading. And task loading is not really good when you're also adding the elements of the water, one, and then the elements of diving with sharks. This is like one of the uh, biggest rules. And in this image, I am in a cave or a cave entrance and I'm wearing a rebreather and a camera. And the steps for me to go from, I'm a cave diving instructor, I'm a cave explorer, I'm a rebreather instructor and all of that. But by the time I put those three together is about three months just to give you an idea, just for that. It was just you know, first the rebreather and then rebreather in the cave. And when this all were very, very good, that then slowly the camera, the camera in the cavern or the camera actually first in the open ocean. So baby steps for all of that. So that when you put them together, everything works. I can actually handle my camera without even looking at the buttons in the darkness of the cave. So I don't need to look down, I can feel them, all right? Once you arrive there, Wonder Woman shirt, sorry. Listen to the briefing. The operators have their rules and they have their briefings. You have to listen to it. Not listen and then watch something else. Just really listen to what are the rules, the bottom time, how the group is going to set up, what you're going to do, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, which brings me into the next point. Respect the rules. It is 
very uncomfortable for an operator to have divers that enter the water and start doing different than what they were told in the briefing. Uh, divers that feel that because maybe they have either more experience or more knowledge or more fill in the blanks, uh, they feel that they don't have to, for example, put the stick in front of their stomach. Oh, I'm comfortable. It's like, I understand that. The, the thing is, uh, do, as I, do as I say, don't do as I do, doesn't really work. So usually the better we are as divers, the closer to the rules we should stick because we're also an example for all the other people that are on the boat with us. So when I go as a guest in any other dive operation with sharks and all of that, I am just like by the T of what the operator tells me to do. And then if they wish, which just happens before, they'll come out to me and say, hey, Christina, do you want to move here for the next dive? Do you want to do that for the next dive? That is your option to offer. But it is absolutely imperative. If you enter the water thinking, oh, well, I don't want to do that, then don't enter the water. You jeopardize yourself. You jeopardize the other divers and you jeopardize the staff that has to take care of you because you're not listening. Simple as that. You don't like how they're doing it, then that is not, we're going back to the research. Do your research. How do they do it? How do they operate? How do they work? What they ask you to do. And if it's something that doesn't match for you, then, then yeah, that's not the place for you. So these are the three things that I look into um, when I want to pick an operator. I want to look primarily that the safety for the people on the tour is their primary concern. That means do they have safety divers depending on where we're going, what we're doing. Is there a bar for me to do a safety stop if we're over the blue? Is there a way for me to prevent from sinking down into the blue if we're doing that, for example? Is there safety divers that help monitor, manage the group? Safety for the sharks. It is something that sometimes we forget. We have to look at the operator and how they work with the sharks. And then the safety for the sharks mean, means um, seeing that there is a, a nice behavior with the sharks. It's not about doing stunts. It's not about doing macho things. It's not doing about bravado. There is an interaction going between the people and the sharks. Uh, but it's nothing of that is detriment to the sharks. And then safety for the people involved in the operation. So safety for the staff. How are the staff instructed to behavior? What is the, the, the gear that the staff is wor working with? How are the staff doing that? Because the goal is to mitigate risks. We can eliminate risk. I'm pretty sure as a diver, you know that. And you read that from the open water manual all the way to the instructor manual. Somewhere there's that word. We mitigate risk through our, our behavior. But there's one thing we need to remember, which is, oops, sorry, my bad. They are wild animals. And as such, there is one part that it can never be completely guaranteed. So we need to go in with all of this preparation and all this understanding so that we can mitigate as much as we can the risks. A fourth one that I add for me is I like to go with local operators. Uh, when I went to Fiji or when I go to Mexico, I like to use operators that are based in the country, but also to employ people in the country. This is a picture of like our crew here in, in um, in, in the Bahamas. And because I very much noticed that through my work that shark tourism does bring value to the sharks. It's an economical value. These are numbers of uh, shark tourism brought alone into the Bahamas in one year. It's a total of $113 million. It might not be the best, you know, like everybody wants to save animals to save animals, but once you give a value, economical value to the animals, then it becomes also part of the country to want to protect these animals. And as a matter of fact, Bahamas, Palau, Fiji, for example, are, are some of the countries that have extended completely their uh, protection over to sharks. If I see an operator, and I'm going to be very direct here, uh, liverboards so sometimes come into our waters, they pay a very minimal fee, their crew is non and their provisioning is not done in the Bahamas, and bring all their customers and all of that. Yeah, they might bring a little bit of attention, but the Bahamians don't benefit. So for me, 
when I go in other places, I want to make sure that the people that are in that operation are from the local environment and do benefit from my presence and my tourism. How I look at the operator. So, um, very basic rules is uh, control the food, control the sharks. That is my number one rule. When I look at an operator, I need to be able to see that if they provide provisioning and there is a food involved, they need to be able to see, yes, you're getting fed. No, you're not being fed anymore. It's crucial. When you lose control of the food, you literally lose control of the sharks. And so we go back to self-provisioning dives. For example, the sardine runs in South Africa. It becomes a much, much more intense dive. It is a dive where you really need to be on your toes, where your skill really need to be good because you are entering an environment where the sharks are literally hunting, right? And you're just an observer. It's like you're standing in the middle of a savanna as the gazelles run away from the lion as he's running after them. And then the, in the process, you could be stampeded on. So there is a, something to say about human uh, feeding is they can, if done correctly with the right container, it can actually control the sharks and it can control the tempo of the dive. The container needs to be adapted to the animal size, mouth and all of that, uh, but in my opinion also needs to be a container that does not provide injuries to the animal. So if it has sharp edges or animals can get hurt, this is one of the things I honestly um, don't like and don't appreciate. The basic, basic rule, one size does not fit all. This is not a unisex t-shirt and uh, it, it does not fit all. So the way we do a shark dive with tigers or with Caribbean reef sharks or with bull sharks or with nurse sharks is dependent on the animals themselves. So look on how the uh, operator work. This is a very, um, picture of one of the chamo gloves that I use. I work with Caribbean reef sharks, which is the smallest tooth right there of the three. And what it does, it prevents from accidental bites. Because if you remember from the video, they're very swarmy. They come very much around people. Where, for example, tiger sharks coming very nice and slow and one or two at a time. And it's actually possible to feed them without uh, the chamo. But the chamo in itself, uh, like anything else, is not uh, a proof for everything. It is a mitigation point. Um, the fact that you're wearing a seatbelt should not allow you to drive at 200 miles per hour in downtown Miami, right? The seatbelt is not going to help you. So the chamel is a mitigation point for the way I work with my Caribbean reef sharks, reach in, remove hooks, of hand feed them and all of that, but it's not the solution for everyone. So one size does not fit all. For every species, we need to watch how it's done and where it's done and all of that. Again, ask those questions. And then uh, the last one, sharks are not a bucket list. Sharks are living, breathing, thinking creatures. And it, we need to accept that it might be there or they might not be there, regardless if the season is correct or not. Um, it's not about being in the water with the biggest shark for me. For me, it's to be in the water and understand them and appreciate them and learn maybe something new. One could be that it's amazing and you can sit five feet away from a feeder, like you saw in the picture with a great hammerhead, and the shark is going to the feeder to feed and swimming over your head and absolutely ignoring you and just making that connection, that type of ability. The shark's actually able to say, oh, wow, there's here food provisioned and these people here that breathe, do the same bubbles of the same thing. They actually, I'm not interested in that. So learning something new about sharks. But it should not be about a bucket list or it's like, oh, I want to see, you know, you doing this with that shark. No, it's each shark is a unique experience. And each one, I think, is absolutely unbelievable and breathtaking. And by the way, this is my group of sharks, uh, what I call them, my babies. And this is a shark junction. It's about a picture taken in about 45 feet of water. I'm out, kind of like on about 10 feet of water on my safety stop, looking down after we finish doing the shark dive and then just there collected. So when we go on a shark dive, what the things, one of the lessons maybe we should come away with is that we need to learn to adapt to the sharks rather than expect the sharks to adapt to us. And I think if we start doing that and then we start um, expressing that to people, 
and sharing our experiences and talking about all this different uniqueness to so start moving away to what I've just done the entire presentation, which is just blob shark all in one big group. And then we can also become a better ambassador for the sharks themselves. And that is where shark tourism, in my opinion, works really, really well. And I've seen uh, phenomenal results, including, like I said, the Bahamas have protected their sharks completely through 2011. Unfortunately, our neighbor, Florida, doesn't do that, and sharks don't understand um, border closure, so they're still traveling in between. And this is actually, hopefully, a little bit of my knowledge. If you want to reach me out, you can reach me at, as you see, www.christinazanato.com. And you can reach me through the contact button there. You can read a little bit more about the work I do with sharks. You can send a message. I always try to reply within the 24 hours or 48 hours, depending on what I'm doing. And uh, happy to you know, answer if you have questions about, oh, I'm going here, or this is my level, and uh, what do you think about that? But just remember, please also do your research. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, if anyone has questions, please feel free to write them in the chat room at any time. Uh, this one's interesting. I was going to ask this if somebody else didn't. <laughs> what do you think about Shark Week? I, I haven't watched a Shark Week in a very long time. Um, two reasons. One, I don't, have, I don't own a TV, I don't have a TV, I don't even have cable. Uh, the other ones is unfortunately um, the Shark Week that maybe, and maybe I should watch it and change my mind again, I was used to, uh, was uh, uh, air jaws, teeth, mouth open, and it was this discrepancy between these people spend months out of the year to travel and be in the water with sharks, and yet during the program, there's always that suspense, attention, and it might resolve into a positive way at the end, but they always start with like, oh, um, you know, like I actually dived with Will Smith and helped him overcome his fear of sharks, but someone at the beginning of the program um, was like, well, you know, Will Smith could actually be dismembered or, you know, die. Then it goes, he goes diving with the tigers, it comes out, it has a beautiful smile and all of that, but there's always that hype up. So Shark Week, turn me off a little bit as far as i understand it has better programs so it has uh maybe a potential i think they still not have hit that mark yet so Perfect. is there a danger with shark dives a very good question that is the number one questions i receive all the time i'll turn it back into how many years have humans beings been fishing Many, the many. first day we put a canoe in the water, uh, dug out of a trunk of a, of, a, of a tree. And then we went fishing and cleaning the fish and all of that. If it's true, the sharks are conditioned to basically go to humans every time we feed them, then every boat, paddle boat, kayak, anyone that hits the water at any time, considering our ancestors still had a bone in their nose and went fishing, the sharks would have learned that already. Because of their senses and because how they work, they do make a connection, but they're capable of, as they come, they're able to scan and go, oh, wow, you don't have any food. The same connection they can make between the feeder and six feet away, the people that are watching the feed, and they're not absolutely mixed together. At the same time, they're not habituated. They can't. Um, most of the sharks are what we call, although they're apex predators, most of the sharks are what are called uh, opportunistic feeders. So they'll go where the food is available. And so when the food it, in that source is not available, they'll go to a different source. Um, proving my point, hurricanes. After Hurricane Matthew, we were out of the water for a month and a half. After Hurricane Dorian, we were out of the water for two and a half. I've been out of the water for three and a half before I actually went back with the sharks. And I went back on a shark dive after COVID between March 15th and July 1st and never been out in the ocean. The sharks were there, the shark had gone mating, uh, the girls that were pregnant had given birth, and they were all there, trunk or without any issues. All my sharks were there. So, no, I don't believe they create a dependence. The same as if you come diving with the hammerheads. The hammerheads are seasonal, they come into the shallow waters of Bimini in the wintertime, but as soon as the water warms up, they out. 
you can bring as much food as you want. You might stretch their residency by one or two weeks. But then when nature says you have to go, the sharks do go. So there's not that dependence. Now, do they congregate where there is a fish? Like if every evening I stop on my dock and clean the fish and throw the guts into the water, would it cause a congregation of sharks? Chances are they'll show up for that. But if I stop, they'll just go ahead and do uh, what sharks do, which is look food for other, um, for other sources. I, oh, there's one. I was going to say I have a couple, but go ahead and answer the ones in the chat room. Um, I have trips scheduled to Farakawa in September. Have you been there? If so, what can I expect or any advice? No, I've never been. We go back to, have you done some research? I honestly don't even know where Farakawa is. I played ignorance on that one. <laughs> I don't know that one either. So that my suggestion would be to uh, Tahiti. There you go. So yes, do you have sharks? Is a star searching for operators that provide shark dives? Um, then according to the operators and the sharks, then figure it out if it is the season, because it looks like you already prepared your trip. So you're going into Fakaraba in September. So are there sharks in September? What kind of sharks are there in September? And which location, uh, which operators you can dive with sharks with? That makes sense. If you want to specifically go shark diving, my suggestion is rather than book a trip and then look if there's a shark dive is pick your shark, pick one or two destinations and plan your trip around that, including the season. Makes sense. Uh, what would you say, what, what shark research do you think is most urgent right now? What are you working on and what do you think is most urgent? So um, I think the, the most urgent, there's, research specifically yeah i think the life cycles of sharks and that is what i am trying to work uh, it, it got all put on hold since covid but one of the the things that i want to try to find out is for example where uh, my caribbean reef sharks go specifically to reproduce and give birth because although they're protected here in the bahamas we're not sure that the locations where their reproduction is guaranteed is also protected so I think the most important, one of the, the uh, most important research that I've seen is uh, following a shark pregnancies and so following their cycles and then following where they go and what they do. So just understanding how all the sharks uh, move around. And again, understanding that they have no borders. So, so protecting the sharks in the Bahamas is, was fundamental. But now the next stretch for me is, uh, can I protect also where they go to live uh, Live, leave their babies and reproduce. Sharks have no parental care. Um, in other parts of the world, I think is we have to go one step even earlier, which is the sharks are still not protected at all. So I think uh, more than research will be like uh, citizen um, and people start researching to what are the local laws of import, export, and then working on um, reducing of the uh, use, consumption, export, killing of the sharks. Okay. So that was some work on. I actually connected with uh, Dr. James uh, Solikovsky, or Solikovsky, as he pronounces it. And uh, we we're thinking about doing a 2021 trip, and which includes tagging the sharks during their mating season, bird season. And also he's thinking about bringing down uh, ultrasounds. So you can actually scan the girls mm -hmm. and see, you know, how far they're in their pregnancies, how many babies they're having in their bellies, and just being able to determine the whole spectrum of just that group of sharks can give very good indication about um, the Caribbean race sharks in general in our area. Very interesting. Uh, you dive in the same places over and over again and probably see the same sharks over and over again. Yes. How do, you, do they have, like, how, what are their personalities like? Do you, do you develop relationships with them as an animal? Yes, you do. Um, it's uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's a different relationship that you would develop with a human being or you would develop with a different kind of animals. But I do recognize each and every one of my sharks um, from physical characteristics. They all have like different faces, different eyes or different colors. Um, quite a lot of their 
uh, identification marks uh, that I use are something that someone that sees them for the first time can actually connect with is one of my goals is to say, oh, you know, that's hook and the bottom of the dorsal fin is shaped like this. So when you see that the shark that has the bottom of the dorsal fin shaped like this, you immediately associate with the name hook. Um, but they do have very different personalities. Some are very, I would say, you know, like ballsy and very, you know, coming in and coming into my lap and coming around me and allow me to pet them. Some of them are more like standoffish. And some are um, a little bit of dominant sharks. I don't want to call them bully, but it's really funny. You see them coming in, if there's a little shark in front of them and they feel is like interfering with them, they'll give them a little, you know, little snap. Same as my dog, I'm fostering right now a little puppy and my dogs, my two big dogs play with him. But when he becomes a nuisance, they're like, enough, right? They'll give him a little things and he just goes a scuttling away. So I see the sharks uh, are doing that. So they have higher keys. Um, some sharks, I remember two of my sharks was Trek and Vulcan. They came in at the same size, the same age about three years ago. And one has stayed kind of like shy, stays a little bit in the outer skirts of the feet. And the other one just completely changed her personality. As she got bigger, she's just like coming in and not afraid of anything. So um, they definitely have their personalities. And a lot of people ask me, you know, how did they recognize you? And I'm like, well, they have seven proved senses. Perhaps there's an eighth one that scientists are studying. I'm pretty sure that they can um, feel me smell me we forget right uh, sharks definitely can smell us so they could smell one diver from another um, different scents uh, they can feel my heartbeats they can feel my brain waves so they do have like a level of recognition for sure do you have an opinion which ones are most threatened and is there something you would recommend we do even in the midwest that we could help well, there's, there's quite a lot of a uh, high list of uh, threatened sharks. So some of the around the waters of the United States are the blue sharks and the mako sharks. Um, those are very much at a high level of threatened. Um, hammerheads follow. Where tigers and Caribbean ray sharks, for example, are still doing okay. Uh, then you have species that are very much uh, threatened by what it's called bycatch. So they are maybe not targeted directly, but they end up into the nets of a different kind of fish and industry. Um, the best way that we can do things is one is if we are still eating fish, um, there's ways to mitigate our impact to the ocean by picking certain species of fish and maybe at a certain point decided that some other fish uh, is not on our menu anymore, which requires a little bit of sacrifice, but I think in the long run is really good. There is uh, the um, Monterey, um, Bay Aquarium has uh, on the website, it's called seasafe.org, and they have a list. It's a green list, a, a or yellow list, and a red list of fish. So green is sustainable, it's healthy, it's good to go. Yellow is somewhat maybe on the border between health, and then red is either non-sustainable, also health or threatening for people. Let's not forget quite a lot of animals in the ocean carry a huge level of mercury. So eating fish is not as healthy as it was um, many years back because the level of mercury is so high and it does affect the health of people. So that is a good way. Um, look at local legislation, for example. See what is allowed to be sold. Uh, shark cartilage, for example, maybe work on reducing the impact on the shark population um, by changing the legislation that you have. And then the basic stuff, um, reduce pollution, by reducing plastic consumption. Um, remember, try to be safe in the way you use products. Remember that whatever we use, somewhere, somehow, how ends up in the water. Remember the quote that he just said, Joran? Water mm -hmm. flows through every aspect of our lives. The oil that falls out of my car that I don't maintain hits the asphalt that then is washed off by the torrential rain which end up into the ground and somewhere somehow is going to hit a river or a body of water and will be carried somewhere either into fresh water body of water or into salt water water and it will eventually affect us all together and i think that is uh, one of the things that we can do is just reduce a little bit our use of like chemicals and, and products like that and i think that will have a general health benefit for, for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. 
biodegradable products like I clean with uh, white vinegar, for example. It's a very good cleaner and is super healthy and not damages the puppies. And uh, Simple Green is another one that is, you know, maybe a little bit more market available. Yeah. Um, if anybody has more questions, I have just one more that was sent to me. So uh, divers always seem to have a story. Do you have a favorite story about an encounter with a shark? Times yes. with a shark. My favorite story is, and will always be, and it repeats each time one of my sharks comes into my lap and allows me to pet her. The first time it happened, I was uh, diving with my mentor, who unfortunately passed away last year, Ben Rose, and uh, this big, maybe seven and a half, eight foot long Caribbean reef shark just swam into me. And I, I've been wanting to, to pet a shark like that for couple of dives and it was not happening and, I, and she just came in the moment I let go she came in and she just rested him and I, and I remember I slowly sunk down to the bottom and knelt on the ocean floor with a shark in my lap and she started to pump they have a system called buccal pumping they can pump water over their gills as they sit motionless and I could feel her jaw opening and closing and I can feel slowly her, she kind of like twitched a little bit and her weight slumped a little bit more and then twitched a little bit more and her weight just slumped even more. And I'm sitting on this ocean floor, right? Those jacks and this and Ben looking at me and I have this sharp, absolute surrender and trust. Like the most beautiful privilege, the first time it happened and every time it happens. And that is where I have that shark into my lap and I, constantly promises that I will make sure not only to hurt you, but I will make sure that you and all the other sharks in the world are not hurt. It is that moment that when, when there is that connection, that trust, because it's not forceful, it's not a forceful behavior. Oh, that's amazing. Well, that looks like to the, be the end of the questions in the chat, and that's the end of the ones that I was given ahead of time. I... <laughs> So much appreciate your stopping in and talking with us and I hope to hear from you again and see more from you. Sure. And, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Our next talk will be in a month. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Christina. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.